Today, the Prime Minister announces a new strategy to scale back migration. Also ahead, the mercury is climbing multiple parts of the country under scorching heatwave conditions. Ceasefire for the Israel-Gaza war vetoed, with the United States saying the pause in conflict Absenciones. will only benefit Hamas. And tennis star Nick Kyrgios reveals on OnlyFans he's pulling out of the Australian Open. Hello, welcome to ABC News. I'm Miriam Korowa. The Prime Minister says a soon-to-be-released response to issues in the nation's migration system will return intake to a sustainable level. Political reporter Nicole Hegarty says greater detail is set to be unveiled on Monday. The main theme of what we're hearing today is that the government does want to return migration intakes, the migration intake a, to a sustainable level, but we're yet to hear exactly what that means uh, or what that number will be. What we do know is that the government wants to reduce the level of net overseas migration, uh, and they're aiming to do that through a number of measures, including uh, cracking down on fraud and abuse of the system, which is something they've previously identified uh, through, particularly in the case of international students signing up to courses that they never really have any intent of following through on and just using it as a way to access uh, a visa to come to Australia. Here's the Prime Minister speaking earlier today. We need to have a migration system that enables Australia to get the skills that we need, but make sure the system is working in the interests of all Australians. Anthony Albanese there. So, Nicole, what more do we know about the response to the review? Well, we know that this is in response to a report that was uh, released earlier in the year uh, from that review. The 200-page report identified a number of issues with the current migration system, labelling it not fit for purpose and saying that uh, anyone looking to uh, find a path to permanent residency in Australia faces a painful, tangled and long process uh, and also that the current system is meaning that Australia is losing out on attracting the most highly skilled migrants which are needed and highly sought after uh, by all nations to fill existing and growing uh, skills shortages. The Prime Minister says that Monday's response will look to address these areas, uh, including fraud and abuse of the system, like mentioned earlier, but also improve pathways uh, for people looking for permanent residency in Australia. So lots and lots of details still yet to be found out, but an initial taste or preview of what's to come today. People in New South Wales are being warned to stay cool today as temperatures in many areas soar into the 40s. Festival and concert goers are being advised to stay especially vigilant with multiple large events set to take place. Shantara Goodwin has more from Lake Parramatta in Western Sydney. It is hot here in Western Sydney. The peak is 43 degrees today and it's going to be as hot if not hotter in other parts of the central and northwestern parts of the state. The Bureau of Meteorology has issued a severe and in some parts extreme uh, heat wave warning for a lot of the state. Health professionals are advising people stay cool, uh, stay indoors, try and look after your health as much as possible. Some families are getting into swimming spots like this one here at Lake Parramatta uh, to get in an early swim to beat the heat. Another popular location is the Parramatta Aquatic Centre where other families are getting in for an early swim to try and cool off. Such a good day for it, isn't it? But I'm trying to get in early to miss the crazy heat. I literally came here at 8 in the morning just to try to get in before it gets too busy. I've never been here before. It's a beautiful new pool, so looking forward to cooling off throughout the day and have the kids are entertained. Now, a particular focus today for authorities are the three major concerts going on in Sydney. We've got American rapper 50 Cent this evening, as well as the Foo Fighters, uh, both at the Sydney Olympic Park, also at the Sydney Olympic Park throughout the afternoon, where the heat 
peaks, we've got the epic hardstyle music festival going on with about 20,000 attendees expected. Now, festival organisers say they're putting in extra safety measures to keep people safe. It's the same group of organisers that organised the Knockout Sydney Music Festival, where two people died in September. But the organisers say they're working with New South Wales health authorities to try to make sure that today is as safe as possible. Now, that includes extra hydration stations, cooling zones, and people are being advised to look after themselves, look after their friends as the heat sets in. Some farmers in New South Wales are being urged to immediately stop harvesting due to increased fire risks as heat wave conditions continue today. The Rural Fire Service says operators in Parks, Forbes, Lachlan and Weddon should at least pause their harvest. Authorities say the hot weather could easily spark and spread fires, threatening lives, property and millions of dollars in crops and equipment. The United States has vetoed a United Nations resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, had pleaded with nations to back a truce, saying aid agencies in Gaza are at a breaking point. But the United States and Israel oppose a ceasefire, saying it would only benefit Hamas. The United States Deputy UN Envoy says the draft resolution was divorced from reality. Members of this council advocating for resolutions have an obligation to explain how their proposals will break the cycle of unceasing violence and support the steps we all agree are necessary to lay the foundation for a more peaceful and secure future so that history does not keep repeating itself. Our goal should not simply be to stop the war for today. It should be to end the war forever, break the cycle of unceasing violence, and build something stronger in Gaza and across the Middle East. While the veto doomed the resolution, 13 of the 15 members of the Security Council supported it, with the UK abstaining. The Palestinian ambassador to the UN said the failure of the vote was disastrous. Hundreds of people will be killed by this time tomorrow. Then hundreds more, and then thousands. Children will be killed, orphaned, wounded, disabled for life, not by mistake, but by design, because the killers have no regard whatsoever for Palestinian life. 2.3 million Palestinians are paying with their lives the price for double standards, bias, racism, Israeli exceptionalism and supremacy. The ABC's Global Affairs editor, John Lyons, has more analysis from Jerusalem. It's becoming more and more difficult now for those people who are, have pushed the two million or so Gazans who went down to the south at the urging of the Israeli army. Now they're trapped. They're trapped up against that barrier. They're trapped up against that fence that goes into Egypt. Um, and there's a lot of fighting around Khan Yunus. There's fighting in the north around Jabalia refugee camp with 100,000 or so people. And so a lot more civilians are being killed. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, has given a very passionate speech saying that um, Israel is committing collective punishment on the people of Gaza, that as the, the atrocities of, of October 7 committed by Hamas should not therefore allow collective punishment of people in Gaza. He's saying that 7,000 children have now been killed by Israel in Gaza and 4,000 women. Um, and there's growing pressure. For example, Jordan's foreign minister, Ayman Safadi, said during his to support a ceasefire, he said that... Um, that um, not supporting a ceasefire would give Israel a license to continue with its massacre, was the word he used. And that's one of Israel's allies. They have a peace agreement. Jordan's just over that there, not that far away from where I am here in Israel. And for Jordan to be saying Israel is committing a massacre in Gaza is, is certainly showing you how there's more and more pressure coming on Israel. We're going to take you now to Sydney, where emergency services have been giving an update. New South Wales Ambulance Service has seen approximately a 20% increase in calls compared to a normal Saturday in the summer period. That will equate to, by midnight, to approximately 500 extra calls. And at this time, our resources are meeting that demand and we'll monitor that into the evening. Anything else? Um, are there any particular areas of Sydney? 
Um, I suppose the weather today has mainly been the Western Sydney Basin and the far west of New South Wales. Um, also a, an area of concern will be the three dance parties that are occurring in Sydney tonight, but there are resources uh, with those and I know that New South Wales Health is monitoring them. Um, as well, as we move into the evening, uh, we ask the community to keep an eye out for vulnerable members of the community, follow up on elderly relatives, check in on your neighbours, ensure that people are rehydrating, monitor people for signs of uh, dehydration or effects from the heat, and that may be decreased level of con consciousness, uh, vomiting, lethargy, they're feeling fatigued, uh, potentially muscle twitching and in extreme cases fitting. And in those cases, if you're concerned, ring triple zero. Um, when you say vulnerable people in the community, are we talking about elderly neighbours, those yeah. people So the people in the, the vulnerable people in the community we, are, we, we ask you to keep an eye out for are those elderly uh, residents, uh, those that are homeless, if you... Uh, let's start that one again. The vulnerable people of the community are our elderly, your elderly neighbours, elderly family, uh, or even those that may be um, not used to being in an area with heat, or you may know they don't have air conditioning or any cooling at home. Uh, Sean, do you want to ask any questions? At this time, Sean, we're unable, unable to break down exactly what type of calls they are from the data. So. And we saw um, in the coast, on the, in the eastern beaches, we're, we're not as cool as they usually are on a day like today. It was 39 degrees of Fuji. We're seeing that represented in some of those calls that are usually concentrated in Western Sydney, but they're a bit more spread out in Sydney than usual in a few ways. It seems to be spread out today right across the New South Wales uh, community. Uh, being impacted by the heat. No specific areas. Sorry. That's all right. And you mentioned those festival goers. Um, that's kicking off this afternoon. There's been heat above 40 degrees in Homebush. I mean, what are your concerns there for people and what's the advice for them? Uh, the advice for the community would be to... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, those attending the dance festivals would encourage them to hydrate uh, to, to wear light clothing and to wear sun protection as we move into the you know, and knowing we are moving into the evening. But the, uh, we'd ask them to hydrate or take plenty of water with them for this evening. And to keep an eye out, uh, there are medical facilities and support on site at all of those medical, at those music events. New South Wales Health is working with the dance festivals and New South Wales Ambulance and the festival organisers to uh, ensure there is adequate coverage and support on site. New South Wales Ambulance, they're giving an update on those hot conditions and extra calls for help, some 20% extra calls across various parts of New South Wales as people respond to those hot conditions. Well, returning home now, and one person who remains missing following a large factory fire in Melbourne South East. Firefighters worked through the night to control a blaze that had engulfed a paint factory in Dandenong. Two firefighters and two factory workers were taken to hospital while one worker remains missing. Fire Rescue Victoria says it's been unable to search the building until a building surveyor deems the structure safe. Police have made what they believe is the largest seizure of illegal steroids in Victoria, disrupting a syndicate operating out of a Melbourne gym. Two men are alleged to have bought the drugs from an overseas supplier and sold them online and from a fitness centre in Port Melbourne. Three people have been arrested and charged with various drug offences. The two men are due to face the Melbourne Magistrates Court today. The raids follow a seven-month investigation involving ACT police. A 37-year-old man and a 35-year-old woman have both been refused bail in Tamworth local court today and are next due to appear on Monday over the alleged abduction of a child who was found last night in the northern New South Wales town of Tenterfield. Reporter Max Tillman has more. A statewide Amber Alert was issued yesterday after a woman was allegedly assaulted and a two-year-old boy abducted outside of an office in Coffs Harbour at roughly 2pm. Triple Zero received multiple calls from people in the area who witnessed the alleged assault and tried to intervene. A 61-year-old woman has been treated for a broken arm, which allegedly occurred during the assault. 
Officers attached to the Coffs Clarence Valley District launched a statewide Amber Alert last night in an appeal to locate the child. And at roughly 11.30 p.m. last night, the child was located in the town of Tenterfield, nearly 300 kilometres away from Coffs Harbour. A man and a woman were both taken to Tenterfield Police Station, where they have both been charged. The 37-year-old man has been charged with taking and detaining a child with intent to remove from parental control, as well as reckless, grievous bodily harm. He's also been charged with breach of bail offences. His co-accused, a 35-year-old woman, has been charged with taking and detaining a child with intent to remove from parental control, as well as breach of bail. The two who are from Tenterfield have faced court today at Tamworth Local Court. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has announced he'll run for a fifth term. He's expected to win the next election, which could see him in power until 2030. Europe correspondent Isabella Higgins has more. Now, officials in Moscow have announced the date for the next Russian presidential election. It's expected to take place March 15 through to 17 in 2024. And the current Russian president, Vladimir Putin, is expected to stand for a fifth term. He announced this while meeting with soldiers who had been serving on the front lines in Ukraine. But many analysts have described this election as nothing more than a formality. And that's because in Russia, many genuine political opponents have been silenced, exiled or imprisoned. And the Kremlin continues to have an iron-clad grip on the nation's media. Now, President Putin has been in the top job since 2000. He served two terms up until 2008. Then he stepped back for four years and served as the country's prime minister before returning to the presidency in 2012. And he's managed to hold on to that position since then. In fact, in 2020, he actually pushed through constitutional amendments that make it possible for him to serve a fifth term. Now, if he is to take on that fifth term at the next election, well, that would see him in power until about 2030, and he would be able to then run for a sixth term, which would see him in power up until 2036. Uh, some independent polls suggest that President Putin does have the support of his nation. One independent poll putting his approval rating as high as 80 per cent. But he continues to be in a standoff with many Western leaders over his war in Ukraine. The International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant for the president over war crimes relating to that conflict. And many exports and individuals in Russia can continue to be sanctioned as an ongoing consequence of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So if President Putin is to take on that fifth term, he is sure to face many challenges. In the UK, ministers have been defending the cost of the government's Rwanda plan after it emerged that another $190 million had been given to the nation as part of its deal to relocate asylum seekers there. It means the scheme now costs more than $450 million before a single asylum seeker has been flown to the country. All dressed up with no one to cook for. This used to be a refuge for survivors of the 1994 genocide here in Rwanda. It was repurposed to host the UK's asylum seekers. This hostel is part of what we now know is a £240 million investment the British government has made into its asylum deal with Rwanda. A BBC crew was here in June of last year when staff were getting ready to receive the first arrivals from the UK. But a year and a half later, it still stands empty. The Home Office says some of this money is for Rwanda's economic development. It adds that there are significant setup costs to ensure asylum seekers are processed sufficiently. But rights groups say the UK shouldn't be partnering with Rwanda in the first place. This is a government where Fundamental rights such as freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom to vote how someone wants to, uh, freedom from arbitrary detention and torture, these fundamental rights are not respected. The Rwandan government says it respects human rights and international law. During Tuesday's visit by Home Secretary James Cleverly, Rwanda's foreign minister pointed out that his country has a long history of welcoming refugees. Refugees in this UN-run centre were brought to Rwanda after suffering abuse in Libya. But although they say conditions here are good, 
Of the 2,000 people who've passed through this camp since it was set up in 2019, none have chosen to stay in Rwanda. Some are the asylum seekers who came from Yemen. 26-year-old South Sudanese refugee John lives in Kigali. We've changed his name and hidden his identity to protect him. Out of 15, 16 million of Rwanda populations, I can say 5 million want to leave. Why? The life standard here is restricted. We all are restricted. The British government says the Rwanda scheme is necessary to deter illegal migrants, and it believes the asylum seekers it sends here will be able to rebuild their lives. But as many refugees in Rwanda want to relocate, that may be a tall order. Ryan O'Neill, a leading star in Hollywood in the 1970s, known for iconic films such as Love Story, and Barry Lyndon has died at the age of 82. His son Patrick O'Neill shared the news on social media that his father passed away with his loving team by his side. The Oscar-nominated actor had been diagnosed with chronic leukaemia in 2001 and then with prostate cancer in 2012. O'Neill was a father to four children and was the longtime partner of actress Farrah Fawcett. Nick Kyrgios has announced he will not be competing in the Australian Open next month. The 28-year-old revealed the decision on the video subscription site OnlyFans, which he joined in recent days. The tennis star only played one match this year after he underwent knee surgery before suffering a torn wrist ligament. Nick Kyrgios says the decision is heartbreaking, but he will be attending the tournament and will take part in commentary. And let's get the rest of the day's sport news with Daniela Intelli. Lisa Healy has been named as the captain of the Australian women's cricket team across all three formats. The 33-year-old steps into the role after leading the team in an interim capacity at various stages over the past 12 months during Meg Lanning's absence after Lanning announced her retirement from international cricket last month. All-round Talia McGrath has been named as vice-captain. The Sydney Sixers have edged out the Melbourne Renegades by eight runs at the SCG in front of more than 13,000 fans. Steve Smith top scored in his BBL return, hitting 61 as the Sixers reached six for 175. In reply, Fraser McGurk smashed 48 off 24 and Will Sutherland hit an unbeaten half century, but the visitors fell just short, finishing on six for 167. Three wickets from Ben Dorcious and some superb fielding ensured the Sixers extended their four-year unbeaten run over their Melbourne rivals. In the A-League, Man's Melbourne City has come away with a 2-1 win over Perth Glory. City midfielder Tolgay Arslan opened the scoring for the visitors in the 38th minute after being awarded a penalty on a VAR review. Adam Taggart drew Perth level just shy of half-time. After the break, Socceroos star Matthew Leckie scored the winner off a brilliant header, earning him player of the match. Earlier, the Central Coast Mariners thrashed Western United 4-0 at Gosford. It's the Mariners' second win of the season, while Western United now has lost six matches in a row and remain on the bottom of the ladder. In the Women's A-League, the Western Sydney Wanderers thumped the Central Coast Mariners 3-0 at the Wanderers Football Park. Sophie Harding finished with a brace, her fifth goal in just three games. The defeat was the Central Coast's second straight loss and sees the Wanderers leapfrog the Mariners into sixth spot on the ladder. The Illawarra Hawks have ended the Perth Wildcats' six-game winning streak with a 100-82 upset win in Wollongong last night. Illawarra's Sam Froling top scored with 21 points and six rebounds. American Jordan Usher was the Wildcats' best, coming off the bench to score 17. The Hawks held a 20-point lead at quarter time and went on to win their fourth match of the season. The Hawks sit second last on the table. Perth is in fourth. The Sydney Uni Flames have celebrated Tez Majdan's milestone match with a 72 points to 70 win over the UC Capitals in Canberra. The hosts led by nine points in the final term before the Flames fought back. Laura Nicholson led the way with 26 points and four rebounds. In her 250th WNBL game, the Australian Opal finished with 21 points.
Olympic champion and Australian mogul skier Jakara Anthony has started her World Cup season with back-to-back -back wins in Sweden. In the super final medal round, Anthony produced a commanding run to score 79.74 points. The 2022 Winter Olympic champion finished 7.32 points higher than the runner-up. The 25-year-old is aiming to qualify for a second Winter Games, which will be held in Italy in February in 2026. She won Australia's only gold medal at the Beijing Games. And Australian snowboarder Scotty James has won gold at the World Cup in China. The 29-year-old made a perfect start to the 2023 FIS Free Ski and Snowboard Halfpipe World Cup, claiming a win in the men's event. James' impeccable run earned him a score of 91.25, more than 10 points ahead of the second-place effort by Japan. The silver and bronze Olympic medalist is aiming for a third Winter Olympic Games. Looking around the country, a mostly sunny and warm day for Queensland with clear skies in the southwest. To New South Wales and the ACT, it'll be mostly sunny and hot across the north, mainly cloudy in the southwest and a late shower in the southeast. For Victoria, isolated showers in the south, some late rain in the northwest and mostly cloudy in the northeast. A rainy day for Tasmania, clearing in the south, mostly cloudy in the northwest. Widespread showers across South Australia with cool to mild temperatures and high winds in the west and north. In Western Australia, sunny in the southwest, showers in the northeast and mostly sunny elsewhere. To the Northern Territory, isolated showers in the northwest top end, late rain in the south and over Arnhem, mostly sunny across the interior. Looking ahead to tomorrow's forecast for the capital cities, mostly sunny for Brisbane, a late shower for Sydney, mostly cloudy for Canberra and Melbourne. Rain for Adelaide, Hobart, mostly sunny. Clear skies for Perth and the chance of a thunderstorm for Darwin. That is the latest from ABC News. Remember, you can also keep up to date at news.abc.net.au and on ABC iView. I'm Miriam Korowa. Thank you for your company. afraid of death, life imprisonment.